not the outcome that we want, but you know, it's only a battle. We're here for the whole war, so yeah, let's go. volumes of the group as a whole. They're a fantastic group of men who care so much um, about playing for the All Blacks. They care so much about making New Zealand proud. Um, so, as Fozzie said, the, the, there's a lot of heartbreak in the sheds right now. and um, It's hard. The images we are going to see for the next four years. Kia ora tato, welcome into the final edition of the breakdown for season 2023 and we have got quite a lot to discuss. So Steve Hansen is going to join us on the show. Of course the regular crew are making their way back from France but we've got an all-star panel to dissect and counsel and get us so through. I was actually feeling okay until I watched that. <laughs> Isaac Boss, Stephen Bates <laughs> and Taylor Johnson with us. Taylor, how has it been the last 48 hours? I don't know, everyone I've spoken to, everyone wants your opinion, your thoughts on the game. Absolutely, everywhere you go you can't not talk about that game. You're at the supermarket, you're at work, everyone's saying what did you think and I think you know, you just can't help but be proud and I know that everyone's disappointed but at the same time they did so well to get to where they are and it sounds weird saying that about an all black team is usually so dominant but you look at all the adversity they've gone through a lot of people didn't give them a shot past the quarter final against Ireland who you know were the number one team in the world after add that and were um, but look I think I'm really proud of how they came together to only lose by one point um, when you had 14 men for the majority of the game I mean that that's a good effort but still disappointed uh, four more years but <laughs> four, more four more years, years. I, it's weird though I don't think I've ever heard the word proud you so much, Isaac, when it's come to an All Blacks loss, let alone in a World Cup final. I know, it's quite amazing what a week brings. You're leading into that game, you're expecting... Our expectations are very, very high, and mm. you're expecting them to probably come away with the victory that South Africa couldn't beat us with the way they're going to play. But, yeah, pride's one thing, but even disbelief, and I said it before, my nieces and nephews, some were cheering for Ireland, and they still wish they were there, but... <laughs> Uh, one of them just couldn't believe the final finish was the All Blacks hadn't won. He said the game should be still going. So, you know, that's our next generation that are, that, that, that are seeing that and they're uh, and he's in tears. So uh, it's, it was a sad day for a lot of New Zealanders. It's probably a bit disappointing, a little bit hollow, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, they had their chances and they just didn't quite nail it, you know, and that's and that's what happened in the final. So it's extremely disappointing. Um, but you mentioned the world proud. They certainly fought, and, and as, a, as a team and as, your, yeah, as any team, all you can really ask for is for your team to fight and put everything on the line and they missed a couple of moments but they certainly fought, didn't they? And they, they tried their very best. And at the end of the day, some days it's just not your day. We've got obviously some big issues to dissect. We'll get into TMOs and all of those kind of things, the future Ian Foster's legacy as well. But if we just look at that game as a whole, is it almost as a reflection of, of where they've been? Good, but not quite good enough on the day. And that's what a lot of people might say. I think they, you know, not quite good enough. South Africa will be disappointed with the way they played. I don't think they played to their strengths uh, totally. But that's what Batesy said before. That's high pressure, high risk uh, environments that, you know, those are the moments that you play a whole season for and uh, unfortunately we probably we didn't nail a couple of those at key times and I think that's that's what it came down to and if they had their moments again, they might change a couple of the options, I think. Yeah. I think South Africa had a bloody hard run into that final. I mean, they had to play Ireland and Paul Blaine and they only won their quarter in their semi by one point, you know, so they had a really tough um, lead up and they were really battle hearted and I think that's where they got on top of us was just their physical presence. I mean, Peter Steph Detroit, unreal. I mean, 28 tackles, most of them dominant. He was banging everyone. Um, and I think he deserved that. And, you know, they all, they yeah, all played their physical game. I think the hardened part is the key there. When you look at where you had the hardest side of the draw, but the All Blacks didn't have a tough game since France. And they beat Ireland, and then it's World Cup final. 
I've still got to remember too on the back of that, and you talk about, we're talking about the All Blacks and the disappointment. South Africa were behind the eight ball right from the start. That is a six day turnaround. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, what's the difference? Six, seven. There's a massive difference between a six and a seven day turnaround for your preparation. Mm -hmm. And also, what they did is they almost functioned for, for 75 minutes without someone to throw the ball in. You know what I mean? So they more or less didn't have a line out. Yeah. They tried to win ball at the front, and they, I, don't, I haven't got their line out stats, but they were poor, and they found a way. The, I mean, because you, you could look at them, yes, being battled hard, and I think going into that semi final against England, where they really did scrape their way through at times, they, they looked tired. Their forwards set, found these reserves of energies in big games to, fi to find that level of pressure. But you look at the All Black stats 61% possession, Taylor, uh, 18 bad passes against four, 15 turnovers conceded. You can blame rest and TMOs all you like, and then yeah. you look at some of the numbers. Yeah, and you've got to look internally as well. I mean, we can't always just blame the ref, and I know a lot of people have been, and I don't like the pile on that's happened. Happened, but there were decisions that we made that weren't, weren't correct. I mean, even, you know, Finlay Christie, two minutes to go, he decided to put in a box kick, you know, and for me, it's hold on to the ball, you know, and it's just those kind of things. I think Aaron Smith had 80 minutes in him as well. Um, but then you also got to look at, you know, the kicks and, you know, Cheslin Colby, I remember, you know, he couldn't even look because he yeah. thought I had cost oh, South Africa the final, Geordie Merce, and then the 51-minute mark didn't take the three. I mean, there's so many things you can look back on, so there's no one... Um, point in that game that lost it for them, but it was just that decision making. It was uncharacteristic. I yeah, think. and I think you know you saw when we beat Ireland in the quarterfinal, Ireland were toying down those kicks at goal, and then it mm -hmm. cost them. You mm -hmm. know, and we were taking them. So little ones like that, I thought was a little bit out of character. Whether that was the pressure and they feel like they had to put a nail in the coffin then, uh, mm -hmm. psychologically mm -hmm. or on the scoreboard, and, and when they don't quite go your way, I, I think it's a little bit. Um, it, it can have the reverse effect. I'll just say with that 61% possession that the All Blacks had, they had to play like that. Yeah. And yes, yeah. the weather didn't suit them, mm. but what they didn't want is they didn't want to stop start game. So they wanted to keep the ball in play. You'd notice that quite often they kicked the ball long, they didn't kick the ball out, Which even though Island really yeah, yeah. even though the South African line out was struggling, you think automatically think, oh let's kick it out, put some pressure on them. They wanted that game to go long and go deep. Mm. And they didn't want the stop start nature. And mate, we've got there's plenty of excuses. At the end of the day we didn't win, but also the conditions didn't help them because no. the All Blacks knew they needed to break down these guys, you talk about them being tired, go phase after phase after phase after phase, and that was part of their game plan. And as I said, sometimes um, things don't go your way, and the, the weather also didn't help the All Blacks, but South Africa have found a way or functioned without a line-out. Yeah, I think, too, there's probably an element with South Africa that will never quite understand the importance for their country and how that spurs them on. Yes, we can go, oh, it's really nice and see Khaleesi amazing, but it's a, a different level of meaning. Yeah, it is, and when you see the footage coming out and friends of mine that are back in South Africa and they talk about what's going on in, you know, shopping malls and everywhere, anywhere where they can find a TV, and I think that's where a little bit... That passion, I think, is... You know, we, we can take a little bit of learning from that. And if we want to really get behind our teams at international level and things like that, and not just say we're paying uh, the homage to it, that's what, that's what true support's about. And I think they, they were inspiring, and it's pretty cool. When, it, when you see that stuff coming through, you've got you to feel good for, for the players as well. And they do have the rags to riches stories as well, which is really, you know, you've you got to love it. And I, like I said beforehand, if there's a team I'd lose to in a World Cup final, it's <laughs> South Africa. England and Australia, I'll, I'll be devastated. <laughs> I don't know. I can, uh, I you might be a better person yeah, than yeah, me, Taylor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, right. <laughs> uh, we want to get to the opinion of someone who has been there, been at the coalface, he has won a World Cup, and that is, of course, Sir Steve Hansen. We caught up with him and and asked just for his the thoughts and reflections on that World Cup final. Well, as a game, you know, it could have gone either way. Um, there was plenty of opportunities for both teams. South Africa, they got to be credited for, you know, their efforts and and uh, and as do the All Blacks. I mean, uh, one point, conversion, a penalty, could have gone either way. As a spectacle, I, I, I was extremely disappointed. Um, not so much in, you know, I know Wayne Barnes is copying a lot of flack and, and so forth, but, but he's not the problem. The problem is the way that we're controlling the game. It, it's being refereed in replay. And uh, for me, it's time to sack the TMO, get rid of it out of our game, other than when the referee asks, is there any reason why I can't award this try? Or is there any reason why I should have will destroy? And there's so much for us to learn out of how the league guys are using their bunker system. You know, gone are the days where the referee has control of the game in rugby. And we're getting a stop start 
no flow. Fans are getting really sick of it and leaving in droves. Um, and, and I don't think the referee's getting a fair crack. You know, like Barnes, you could see he was getting frustrated with the game himself. And, and this is the other thing about the Timo. He always only comes in when something's missed. But if the referee gets something wrong, you don't hear him coming in and saying, look, check, check, check. You got that wrong. And, and, and Artie's is a, is a classic case. You know, I, I don't care if he didn't see the replay. I did. And clearly, Artie had let go within the rules. He let go of the player and then got back on the ball and should have been he should have got that penalty, not a, a penalty against him. So you've got an inconsistency there. And then we've got the, the this red card stuff. Like, we've got the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Yes, I know and I understand and I appreciate that we have to look after our athletes. But our game is a contact sport game. And when you've got a player in the best form of, of his life and Sam Kane saying to you, look, I got caught out with a late shift and he couldn't adjust... And then you see Khaleesi, the same thing happened to him. Two great players at the very best of their game who can't adjust in time to something that changes just like that. You're going to have contact, unintentional contact. To give that a red card, in my humble opinion, is just ridiculous. A, because it takes away the contest. B, it's not fair on the player that gets sent off because he hasn't. he's not committing foul play. Until we sit down at the very top and work out, right, how do we get some common sense into our officiating of the game, we're going to turn people off watching by the droves. Always forthright. There's, there's kind of two issues in there, one to unpack. One is the influence of the TMO, the other is the red card situation. Let's start with the TMO. We're not going on a witch hunt, we're done, we're, everyone's OK, we're just going to try and find some solutions. So we're going to save the game. Starting with you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree with Sir Steve. Well, it's hard not to. But the, the thing I, I, I like around the red card, uh, the TMO and stuff like that. What you've got to be, what you've got to be aware of. Then, if that's how we're going to do it, and that's how I believe it should be done, there's also is going to come into this human error. So you look at the Artie Savia when he knocked the ball of the line out, the Aaron Smith try. If we go down that fa that route, um, then what happens is that's a try, and you've got it. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have Wayne Barnes 2007. No, you can't, and you have to live with that. And that's that's a beauty of sport. There is human error in it, even if you don't, even if you like it or not. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think he's got it right, and I think the bunker was uh, and legal was a, a big, very controversial to start with, and they refined it well. Now, when it comes down to points being scored in that passage of play, those are the crucial areas that you really need to make sure that you get right, and that was the try that we had to slow, but it's also the, um, the kick-out goal that they got, and that's the difference in the game. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because I agree it should be just the ref bringing them in, but it's always, you know, the team are coming in, hey, I've got something. And it, and it forces Wayne Barnes into a position like, OK, well, now I have to make a decision on something. And, you know, the, the players do actually move on, you know. Like, everyone, yeah. like, you didn't see the South Africans blowing up, like, you know, where was that knock-on because it was found. And if you're going to slow everything down, you're always going to find the error. I mean, you know, I, I always use the example of when you're picking go defence. How many head-on-heads head heads do you see in that when you're just trying to stop them on the line? If you slowed that down, you'd have eight guys in the bin from, from that. So I, I, and I, one thing I do like, though, with the TMOs back when we used to have that captain's challenge and, you know, use them there for your advantage. Like, if you didn't agree with that call, I'd said, can I actually challenge that? And then that, you know, like in tennis, you only get one shot, if, you know, mm -hmm. and if you got it right, yep, good, um, but if you got it wrong, no more challenges. I, I, I did like that when we did have that iteration, you know. Mm. Can I just say, Ricky, we, we talked just briefly about it, um, and we're talking about the TMO and stuff like that, but what we, in my opinion, what we want to get out of the game is that stop-start nature. Yep. It always stops and it's boring, mm. and we look up at the screen and everyone's waiting for someone to make a decision for two and a half minutes and it's boring. So, yes, we want to get the, referee, uh, the, the TMO out of the game, but, for example, in the Sam Kane incident, can he just say, Wayne, Sam Kane, head-on-head, yellow card, send him off. Or alternatively, can they say, Wayne, I'm just going to show you something without giving any opinion? Because Wayne Barnes is the best referee in the world and he didn't get to make the big decisions in that game. So is there a way to still have that TMO 
but just with a reduced roll. We don't need your opinion. I'm just going to show you this. There might be something there, there might not be. I yeah. don't know. And I think it's a, a bit to do as well with intent and foul play versus accidental. And, and that comes, it sort of crosses the both of interjections and, and the, um, the red cards and stuff. But why can't you just say, look, you know, deal with it at the time. We'll have a closer look later on. It's most head on heads always accidental. Mm -hmm. I don't think play, <laughs> I've ever come across someone that's going in there trying to get a head on head. So that could be dealt with because that comes down to technique and um, things that are drilled in and it's harder to change. If that's a regular occurrence, then there's a, lot, a bigger issue with the player. But I think that should be looked at after the game rather than at the time. Well, that was the other point that, that Steve Hansen is making, isn't it? Red cards are basically being uh, dished out for bad technique as yeah. opposed to malicious intent. Yeah. Can I just say one other thing on that subject as well? It, this has all come in for the player safety, and he said it as well. We've got to have player safety, I understand that. But if we're just talking about player safety, let's look at the two incidences. Which one would cause more damage to the head? Uh, Khaleesi's one or Sam Kane's one? His one is straight to Artie Savia's face. There's more impact than that. Watch this here. There's more, bang. He has come from 10 metres away, right? And bang, there is more impact in that than there is Sam Kane, who is a metre away. So if we're talking about player safety only, that's worse. And how many of the four players involved in these incidents, tacklers and ball carriers, mm. went for head injury assessments? Exactly, that's, that's the whole thing, is we, we introduce all these rules around, you know, um, tackling and all this and the accidental, blah, 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 trying to stop people from doing it, but... It's kind of like, well, no one went off to, to get assessed. And that's the biggest thing. You can't bang on and say we're looking at um, you know, player safety. If that wasn't even the main concern, it was sending them off or not. So, I mean, all four, if we're going to really talk about safety, should have gone and had a check. Well, on that, you guys are all coaches. You're involved <laughs> in junior levels. You, you're coaching at high performance level club coaches. In the last decade or so, with the advent of rugby league coaches, guys and, and girls, players are tackling upright. So if we've taught them to tackle like that, how difficult, Batesy, is it to teach them to get lower again? Yeah. To, it, change, to change those attitudes, to change those minds? It is difficult. It is difficult. It is. Um, but also, you've got to remember, at the end of the day, why we're, uh, why we're tackling more upright, especially that second guy in, is because we're trying to slow that ball down. Mm. Because we know if they get lightning quick ball, that they're gone and they're going to split us on the edge. So there are techniques in what happens, is you'll see a lot of guys, second man in, chest people now, because a chest to the head is fine but a shoulder to the head is no good. So, you know what I mean? And that's, hey, but rules come in, and at the end of the day, there's always people trying to bend those rules a little bit. Chest to the head is fine, shoulder to the head's no good. Yeah, one thing that I have noticed, though, is there has been a lot more, just watching, observing women's club rugby, there's a lot more um, head knocks from hitting the hips. Yeah. Um, because, man, that hip bone, once that collides here, you're, you're gone, as you know. Um, but I've also observed, you know, junior rugby, um, shout out to St. Peter's under 15s. Um, <laughs> they champions, St. Peter's <laughs> under 15s. They are they? champions, but well, yeah. <laughs> but I tell you what, like, a lot of them are making those low tackles um, because they're taught it. And it's really hard, you know, at, at Batesy's level, um, at that high performance, is because you've been taught so long to tackle up here but when you're actually getting it drilled from a young age I mean we grew up watching Sonny Bill making you know shoulder charges and I was like that's mean <laughs> no one's like awesome chop tackle you know no <laughs> one's doing that watching the All Blacks like damn look at that chop tackle no one's doing that look at that big hit so there's that mentality shift that hasn't quite happened yet but I think 10 years time maybe but it's, it's a long way to go you always went low yeah, I, I had no option, you know. But I, like, <laughs> and it's called a speed bump. <laughs> it's not. And I'd recommend. Well, there's a difference. The, maybe I shouldn't say this, but any small nine, they never pass the ball. Just run at the tall guys around the ruck because it's a penalty waiting to happen. You're going to win the game. Yeah. You're going to take that into senior rugby, aren't you? Trying to tackle you, bossy. <laughs> that tall. Bates people too busy running around with their chest like this. But I, but I would say, I, I would say, you talk about the chop tackles. You know, you take it back to one of those try savers in the weekend. Why? Well, a great chop tackle. Oh. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. But yeah sometimes couldn't go a chop tackle does what does, doesn't it? <laughs> um, well, the team over in Paris have doing, been doing some massive mahi in the last, what, eight, nine, ten weeks. And we thought, well, we found Jeff and Mills somewhere in transit, we think, in Hong Kong. Some thoughts from them after that final. We're halfway home, Mills. We're in Hong Kong. Yeah. We've had a bit of time now to reflect, not just on what's just happened on the weekend, but obviously Ian Foster's final season in charge with the All Blacks, a number of senior players heading away. Um, but let's reflect on the World Cup for a start. Yep. You know, uh, the All Blacks going in, very much the unknown. Um, the last couple of weeks, clearly a big, big result against Ireland, not quite getting across the line. But when you look at it, um, how would you sum up the Rugby World Cup, but also from an All Black perspective? Well, obviously the result at the end of it, you know, 
as we're bitterly disappointed. Um, would have been a fairy tale finish, wouldn't it? Uh, the fact they came in um, perhaps wasn't the sort of the spectacle that we were expecting from the final, but <clears throat> South Africa thoroughly deserved to win that. But to get them there, that was always going to be the big thing. And I suppose looking back at it now, that Irish game was, um, you know, we, as we always knew it was coming. It was a little bit anxious moments during throughout that week, but probably the best game I've sort of seen for a very, very long time, in fact, ever. Um, sort of experience, really. Um, but all in all, they didn't come away with a with a goal. Was a success. Well, I think you look. You know, we constantly talk about the fact, you know, where they've sort of come from. You'd probably say it was a success to get to the finals. Um, albeit they, they just missed out in South Africa. Look, he's had four years um, you know, yeah. since 2019 to try and prepare. The first two of those, we had a certain pandemic that went around the world, yeah. which certainly challenged the All Blacks. They made um, and took some experience and uh, risks um, with some players. Look, I think if they'd look at it. Um, the change they had to make last year in terms of the coaching, it took a while for them to find themselves. And then the likes of, uh, I suppose, the failed Roger Torvasashek, yeah. how much did that affect them finding ultimately their right team and the balance of their squad? So, I mean, I think Ian Foster, what he's managed to do by the end of this Rugby World Cup, I think has made up the ground that they've lost in terms of getting yeah. back to where they are in world rugby. Um, he'll be bitterly like, disappointed, like you say, but I think in terms of the legacy and what he's left, He's had to overcome some real challenges. And, you know, he'll look at some selections. I think he'll look at maybe the team he put together initially. He'll ask some questions about whether or not um, he was getting the support he needed yeah. around the group, Mills. Um, but ultimately, he can walk away knowing, I think, that he's he's put pride back in the jersey. Yeah. And I, I can su certainly support him on that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think 100%. I think given where he's sort of come from, I think what you've got to remember also, or whilst he's gone through COVID and stuff like that, um, it's probably the only time a coach has really had to really adapt. Adapt because of the challenges they've had. He's lost, you know, and then after that, he's had to adapt again. Lost a couple of coaches, lost a selector. But I totally have to agree. Um, you know, under a lot of scrutiny, there's talk about all the records that have been, the unnecessary records that he's sort of broken. Um, guys coming out and saying the aura's lost this, isn't it? I think he's restored that. I mean, he's got it to a point um, that, that he had it to, you know, um, you know pre-taking on this, uh, this role. What we do know is that World Rugby have got some serious question marks and things they need to answer to. In fact, first and foremost, the draw needs to be sorted yeah. for the next Rugby World Cup in terms of trying to get the best teams through to the quarterfinals, the, the semifinals, and they've expanded this tournament. Fascinating <laughs> to see how that plays out. And, of course, a lot of discussion about the shape of the game, what it's going to look like, and how it should be officiated going forward. Those are things they need to address not the stuff that we wanted, wanted to be talked about, were they? You know, um, when we came to this tournament, you know, Super Bowl obviously was going to be the most you know, fast moving, you know, action packed. It hasn't. It's come out, and all we're talking about is the refereeing inconsistencies in the refereeing, the shape of the game, and how that sort of look. There's still contentious issues about, you know, the, the tournaments happening. So it's not it's not looking uh, as healthy as well, I would have wanted it to be. Yeah, and saying that, there were some surprise packages, I think, in the lyrics of Uruguay, uh, Portugal, Portugal, coming into the tournament, showing some good Fiji. signs. But ultimately, Fiji, yeah, but this game has got a lot of things that need to be addressed and talked about. But it's been a big year, Mills. It's been a long eight weeks. <laughs> Team, I cannot wait to get home and see my family, um, but I can't wait as well. As always, guess what? It's a new season. But that's, that's a couple of months away. Okay, let's just take a break. Let's take a break. We're not, we might not make the cut. <laughs> Jeez, it looks like a long old trip home for Mills. Um, he's only, <laughs> he was only halfway there. Um, as rough as it you know, can say it when he's in the air. Um, <laughs> one of the points they do bring up, though, is Ian Foster and where his legacy is. And we asked Sir Steve Hansen as well how he sees Ian Foster's tenure as All Blacks coach. I think he should be remembered as a coach that had to go through COVID, had to go through a period in our game where uh, he probably didn't get the support um, as much as he should have. I think he got the greatest affirmation you can get as a coach is when your players love you. And they certainly know what's going on 24-7 your players, and if they uh, don't think you're good enough, they'll tell you or they'll tell people you need to go. The main thing is we got behind Ian during that World Cup, and I think the public uh, swung him behind him, which was wonderful. Um, and, and, you know, by the grace of God, he could have, you know, the team could have easily won it. You know, Geordie Barrett will, will forever be asking himself, you know, why did I miss that? 
um, Richie Moana are the same with the conversion. But, you know, that's sport. Mm. That's why World Cups, big events are hard to win because sometimes we just don't get what we want. We have to accept that. Uh, and I think that's where Fozzie's earned, you know, his money. He's accepted what's been passed down to him, but he's still gone out and done a job that he can be proud of, we can be proud of, and most of all his players are proud of and, and love him for it. So this is Ian Foster's coaching record. The numbers that he will be judged by rightly or wrongly in his tenure as All Blacks coach. Or is it coach 41? So a 70% winning record, which would, on the face of it, I think a lot of rugby coaches, Eddie Jones would be happy for a 70% winning record <laughs> right about now. But um, um, Isaac, Batesy, you both know him. You've been coached by him. Um, what it, where do you see his tenure and his legacy? Well, whenever I see Fozzie, all I think is is, is <laughs> boss's old man. It's the it's the Tukaroa TA connection. So I'll leave it to his son over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, just because he never picked you, baby. That's why you're sitting here. You're never going into those <laughs> tournaments. But no, I think he actually probably resurrected himself as a coach, mm. uh, especially in this last year. And uh, I really like what. Um, Steve Hansen said there where he said like the greatest information you can get is when your players stick by you. Mm. And they did it last year. The whole country wanted his head, basically. He was out the door. He was he out was the door. Gone. And basically he's done the unthinkable of getting them into him. They've created moments to win the World Cup and they just haven't quite nailed the moments. And this is not even 12 months on from, from where they were. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, seeing signs of him as a coach. And where to from here, I think, you know, the world's his oyster to yep. an extent. I just think around that, and I, I don't have the stats on me, 70%. I don't know where he stands in, in the all-black coaching scheme of things. He's off the back of, like, Graham Henry, Sir Graham Henry, Sir Steve Hansen, so a pretty hard act to follow. But I do believe that that sort of percentage is going to be the new norm for all-black coaches. I don't think we're going to have all-black coaches that are in the 90s anymore. I think the game has changed around the world, and I think our time of dominating week in, week out, year in, year out, has gone. And, and then it comes to me, the question is, is if we won, if we scored two more points on the weekend, yeah. two more points, right, do then we forget all the rest of the four years and then it's just like South Africa, it's World Cup to World Cup. Yeah. What happens in between that, does that really matter if we're the world champions? But do we need to forget the last four years because he never lost the rugby championship, we never lost the Berlin, so we still retain the Freedom Cup, we kept all of those and we did better than the last World Cup. So, you know, like, we actually have to look at it at that perspective as well and, and to your point, everyone else is caught up, that winning percentage I think is going to be the norm. Um, you know, you look at the investment that people at like Ireland made, you know, five years ago if you'd said Ireland is going to be the number one team in the world. I would have laughed because of, you know, the All Blacks and that we just had such dominance. Um, and then you also look at Australia. They're also, you know, everyone else has, has invested and Australia hasn't, they're, you know, NRL, all that kind of stuff is there. So that's also worked against them too. So others have got better. Australia, you know, they've had more competition. And the All Blacks, yes, we're still up there. You know, we're not outright the best like we used to, but it's totally representative of the rugby landscape at the moment. So I think Fozzie has done an outstanding job and shouldn't be remembered as one of, you know, people say, oh, he's the worst coach I've had. No, he's not. You look at that and he's done well. He was on the back foot in the court of public opinion right yes. from the very start as soon as he took over that job. Do we perhaps almost need a better understanding of the quality of rugby in the Northern Hemisphere? Yes, there's all the North-South thing, but of, of Ireland and France and what they actually do in their grassroots and the way they bring things through that, you know, we, we can't just turn up and win anything. Anymore. No, and I 100% I, I agree with you. And our probably our rugby IQ is probably diminishing a little bit. Uh, and uh, as I say that as a, as a purist, and I've been in all the different environments, and they're very well coached. And from a young age, they know their rugby there in Europe now, whether it's Ireland, England, France. But it's also the fact that our grassroots competitions, uh, the NPC, thoroughly brilliant. I think the next step up, the Super Rugby, is challenging. And it's challenging uh, the makeup. You can see it having an effect on Australia, and it's going to have a similar effect on us at the moment, I think. And I think the biggest competitions in that in that real professional era, uh, the, the better ones are in the Northern Hemisphere, I think. And I think that's teaching them how to win uh, final moments like that. Before we move on, where do you think Ian Foster goes now? I don't know. And he said recently that he wants to keep coaching. But what I do know is it's been a tough four years. It has. You know, you said uh, that. that 
some areas of the public have been against him, but what he's done through that is Jeep as he's built up some resilience and Jeep as he's built up some, some real understanding of how to deal with different things and get through those times as well. So I'm not sure where he goes. Um, Australia's looking for a coach. I, know, that's I don't think so. I don't think so. He won't do it. He won't do it. Fiji's looking yeah. for a coach. So, but I'll tell you what, he's got a wealth of experience on good times and bad times. Yeah. So yeah. what a man to have involved yeah. in your system. Maybe not as head coach. Maybe that's not what he wants to do. Well, while we're doing some crystal ball gazing then, uh, let's have a look at this. Now, this is the breakdown production crew's potential first test team for a test. I know, I know we have only just finished this year, but we're going to 2024 already. <laughs> so a front row of three guys who played and started a, a World Cup final. And then you look at the locking department. Obviously, this is going to be an area to Povai, guys like Josh Law come into the mix, Scott Barrett um, obviously is a contender Sam Kane still with a C by his name can, according to our production crew Artie Savia, Ethan Blackadder, over to the backs then you've got, well, in a potentially very exciting combination of Roygaard and McKenzie, through the middle, Geordie Barrett's still going to be there Rico Ioani, the long term partnership in the middle by the look of that, and then out the back boy, that is some excitement, Will Jordan Emoni and Arawa and Mark Talia, and these are just guys, that the crew have come up with, we're missing a few there, but basically we get like all wound up, oh, so many players are leaving, and yes, this time around there are some absolute legends leaving, mm. but it's not all doom and gloom, that's not a bad side. No, certainly not, and there's plenty of people, as you mentioned, that uh, on the back of that, you look at guys like Anton Leonard Brown, he hasn't got a spot. Mm -hmm. uh, Finlay Christie hasn't got a spot. Mm. You've got a couple of guys that missed out on the World Cup this year that have had bad runs with injuries. Mm. Patrick Tupelotu, Akiri Iwani, you know what I mean? So there is people around, Callum Grace from down Crusader country, so there, there's people around, and and what it does become is it does make Super Rugby a whole lot new, more interesting because you've got a new coach, a new mm. setup, and within reason, everything goes out the window. So it's a genuine competition right now. Can we not make it a four-month a, a four All Blacks trial, though, Super Rugby, this year? We actually sit and enjoy and see what these guys do. Please. Can they all please play? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just on that, I mean... The top 14 players, they play something like 40 games. Half of them are back. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and then we're going to even like, this is a conversation for another day. <laughs> but, I mean, when you look at that team, it's exciting. And I remember watching the post-match pictures. Yes, Geordie Barrett was crying. But, you know, I saw the look on Dalton Papaletti's face. And it, it was devastation, but it was also... He was annoyed, and you could tell... I never want to feel this kind of loss again. So mm. you look at someone like that young who felt, you know, they were almost there. He was devastated. And he's someone I think, you know, be careful in the next few years. Yeah. He could be there too. And there's a number of those players that have a taste and with uh, through the NPC, even we've seen some really good bolting players. And you've got the likes of Savia who, who might not be eligible in the first test. So, you you know, that will be the Dalton Papali'i's or mm. um, Luke, Jacob. Luke Jacobson's. Mm. You've got Lord in that lock. You've got, don't discount someone like TJ Perinata. Mm. You know, his experience could be really crucial in building through some of these young players to come through uh, for the next four years' time. Quinta Pyre at 12. So all of a sudden, we look at that depth, there's a lot of depth. You know, we're missing a few key players that were big, they were here for the World Cup and win the World Cup, and they'll be disappointed they didn't get it, but they've left New Zealand rugby, I think, in a really good spot, and uh, it's an exciting time ahead. Well, we have still got plenty to look at here on the breakdown. We're going to take a wee breather, and then after the break, have a look at the winners and, well, the winners from the World Rugby Awards. <laughs> It might not have necessarily lived up to expectation on the field sometimes, but it certainly did off the field. It was an absolute vibe, and I reckon it has probably made a fair bit of money uh, for a few of those bars and whatnot around the place in France. Uh, the other big thing that happened at the end of the World Cup is, of course, the World Rugby Awards held just yesterday in Paris, and the World Rugby Player of the Year is Adi Savia. I don't think we're going to get any uh, disagreement on that one. In fact, Taylor, I actually saw a social, and usually you'll find some salty South Africans or something who disagree but even conceding, he 
has been and is superb. Absolutely. Like, his peers say it, his opposition even say it, it's like everyone's got tremendous respect for him and he has had an incredible season. Not only here, but in Super Rugby as well. He he wears his heart on his sleeve as well and he's a really likeable character and I think that's why everyone just gets A bit of personality board. too, yeah. Right? yeah. But also, you know, when you see so much emotion on the field as well, you can see how much it means to him. It's not just his job, you know. Rugby's not just his job, it's, it's everything. And you can see that and he cares about, you know, everyone. But, man, he so deserved that. I mean, there was plenty of good people. I mean, Eben Etzebeth is one of my favourite players, <laughs> like, yeah, ever, Arke ever. Arke. But I do think Artie deserved that. Yeah, Bundy Arke, Antoine Dupont. But, it, yeah, I mean, we're all obviously going to be quite biased yeah. about this one, aren't <laughs> we? But it's, it's hard to go past him. Oh, it is hard to go past him. And, I, and that's, like you said, when it's the other the players in other countries, mm. they're all saying who's the hardest player to play against. You know, they can't get past him, they can't tackle him, mm. and he just carries the whole team with him. So I'm pretty, you know, wrapped for him, and he thoroughly deserves it, so... I'll just say on that, and, and, and everyone says that rugby's a game for like in the forwards for really big men. He's not a big man. Mm. He is not a big man. Yes, he's very dynamic, but he plays number eight, grew up sort of playing seven, but it shows you that his ability to break tackles and his leg drive for a guy that you compare him next to uh, Fumulin or mm. Steve of... Uh, Steph the toy, like he's tiny compared to him. You know what I mean. So it's actually it's actually quite refreshing to see guys like that compete and not only compete but dominate. All Blacks captain, or is that best just to leave him do his thing? It's interesting, right, because you, you give him a task and you want him to do it, and I think that, as you say, it might just add a bit too much. He's captain, you know, teams of four, um, but I do think with someone of that calibre, you just don't want to add it, add it to their plate because he already carries a team. Or, no, I don't want to say he carries them on his back, but he carries them, you know, in, in a sense of getting them up each game, and so in order to make that your role now as well might be a bit different. I, I don't know. Like, I mean, they're so used to a Sam Kane kind of captain, and he's yep. chalk and cheese, so I don't know if they're ready for that. Um, I think he leads enough by what he does in, yeah. the, yeah. in the field, whether it's defence, attack, and you've got your, um, you know, it's the same as having a 10 that's the World Player of the Year, whether it was Moang or Barrett or a Johnny Sexton, and I know he was captain this year, but you always think because he's the best player, do you make him captain? Just mm. let him do his thing. Mm. Uh, he leads by example anyway, and he's a leader. You, the captain's just the figurehead of a leadership group, and he's he extends himself into that. And in some ways in that, Bossy, a captain should be the person that speaks to the referee the best. Because everything else that happens as a leadership group, mm. you know what I mean, yeah. that goes on behind the scenes and you're all working together. So whoever can speak the English the best, go speak to the referee, you know? <laughs> Batesy, you're not very well out <laughs> no, 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 Not Batesy's department. <laughs> uh, World Rugby Breakthrough Player of the Year, Mark Tellia winning that award. To Mighty Williams, what a recognition for him to be a finalist. Marnie Leboc and Louis Bielbiari, the French winger, who is going to be some player. But Mark Tellia is, you know, as you think, is, I always think he's smaller than he is, but he's actually big upper body and just that ability and close. He, he was brilliant the other night, Batesy. And, and how they use him is really good as well. Like, and you see that clip there. What they do is they chuck him in around the rucks and then mm. when they're picking going, then they just you see him hovering around there and they push him out when it's not there. Then he comes back in. It's just ability to beat people in small spaces um, really gets the All Blacks on the front foot. That's exactly it. He can beat people in small spaces. Nothing is on. You're just like, okay, carry. And <laughs> yeah, somehow Mark's got through <laughs> six defenders. You know, he's he's so explosive and he's genuinely someone when they get their hands on the ball, you get excited, you know, and he could be not even in space. You're like, oh, Mark's got the ball. What's he going to do? And I love that about him. He, he's And he's got such a cool story too. And, and you forget that he is, like, because he's been around New Zealand for a few seasons now and, and you forget he's a breakthrough player yeah. at the international, you know? Yeah. So, like, I think, gee, he's been, he's been around a long time. But, uh, and there was controversy about him even being selected in the All Blacks, and now look what happened. So mm. I, I think it's, yeah, he, he's definitely a talent. Could have been a number of players, but, yeah, very, very good. Happy for Mark Lear. The other New Zealander to win an award at the World Rugby Awards is Women's Sevens Player of the Year, Tyler Nathan Wong, beating out her teammate Michaela Blyde, Riapi Lunisel from Fiji, and Maddie Levi. And I, well, hands up, I'm a judge on this panel. I voted for Tyler, and I think Taylor, she's probably a player who year after year for 10 seasons in that team does her job, goes about it, and not, doesn't always get the recognition. And an absolute professional at that. And you also got to, you know, admire Madison Levi broke records this year. Yeah. The most tries ever on the series. And Tyler still got the award because that's how good she has been. And you're right, every single year, she just gets better. You know, and with a lot of these players, you see them fluctuate in form. I've never seen Tyler 
drop down out of form and you know she's had injuries and come back still been fine so she epitomizes everything about that black fern sevens environment like she's such a great person on and off the field and I, we, we talk about that a lot but just her presence on the field as well she's someone who can turn you know nothing into something mm. outstanding she deserved it Aquila Rokoli Soli Ricarda uh, all, all black sevens players were finalists that was won by Rodrigo Isco also too just to mention the women's 15s awards will be announced after this weekend's WXV so women's player of the year and uh, dream team and all of those kind of things. Speaking of dream teams, let's have a look at the dream team selected for the season. I think it's important that we do say that this is for the season, not just for the tournament. So here is the dream team of the year. Cyril Bay, the French prop, Dan Sheen and Tug Furlong in the front row. The locks are Evan Etzebeth and Scott Barrett. And the loose trio has in it, I can't remember off the top of my head, Kaylin Doris, Adi Savia and Charles Olivon from France as well. Out to the back line, Antoine Dupont and Richie Moonga, the first five selected in that side. Irish midfield of Bundy Aki and Gary Ringrose. And then a back three of Will Jordan, Thomas Ramos and Damien Panot, the two Frenchmen as well. Right. <laughs> so I guess probably the most noticeable thing in there is that there's only one South African bossy uh, and even it's with you can't argue with but can the South Africans feel rightly aggrieved or yeah I think they can um, and look I, I wouldn't put any of their backs in there because they've been playing with many backs <laughs> on the field to be honest uh, and they've been topping and changing but uh, look that front row they've been strong uh, and we spoke about this earlier Batesy with a you know whether it's the tight head or loose head that goes in um, look there's some quality players but because and they've been playing that way now for a long way, a, a long way through the season with uh, two front rows. So I, I, I expect them that they should have had another front row in there, to be honest. Um, and if you look at the other, the other side of that, yeah, look, there's probably we're probably a little bit lucky in some aspects as well um, as All Blacks who, who got in. Can, can I just ask though, like, can they be aggrieved, like, you know? Well, as I say, are they a sum of the parts team? Yeah. That's the thing. It's the collective well, that has made them so exactly. brilliant, not necessarily player for player. A hundred percent. Who are you putting in for those guys that are there? Like, you look at how they roll their roster, quite a lot of their forwards that we're talking about going in, they only play 45 minutes, if that, you know? So you look at it that, that, sort, of, that sort of way. Um, is it just a credit to South Africa? They've only got one guy who's in the best um, 15 in the world, apparently. It's subjective, obviously. Yeah. But they're the best team in the world. So we're not the best players, but we're the best team. That's because our culture's good. That's because our leadership's good. That's because our coaching's good. That's why we're the best. Not because we've got the best players, you know? And obviously, things change. No, get someone else to name a team, it'll be different, you know? You could also say they don't really play rugby, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. You sound like you're still salty. <laughs> We're not being not salty. <laughs> um, the midfield, like, Bundy Arkey oh, totally deserves brilliant. it. Bundy is in the form of his life, and I do think that's probably the most Irish we'll ever see in that team, because... Mm. If they were to win a World Cup, it had to have been this year. They've got too many people leaving. You know, Bunny's in the form of his life now. Will he be in that same form in four years' time? You know, um, Ring Rose outside of him. I think maybe benefits from being outside someone like Bundy, who's breaking the line. If you're running off that guy's shoulder, you know, surely you're going to pick up some tries and get in some space. Um, but then Maung is an interesting one as well, Batesy, isn't he? Because you've got Sexton um, there, who obviously fed that that rope, but I think, been in the yeah, naughty boy chair. Yeah, naughty, and same for Owen Farrell. So yeah. that's probably ruled them out of contention, so mm. then where do you look at, at tens? Well, yeah, I'd say someone like Finn Russell. He's been class all year and maybe misses out a little bit. And Moang has been good, but I think he's had a, had a great tournament. Mm. And this is the tournament versus the uh, versus the season, whereas Finn Russell didn't get a chance to go deep into the tournament. But I think he's been probably one of the, the tens uh, through Six Nations and the early stages of the World Cup. And again, Bossy, just go back to your point around the South Africans. Or oh, let's pick a South African at 10, hold on. They switch yeah. between mm. the two. Mm. Yep. So, you know what I mean? Like, it's, you know, it's hard to say where Moanga has been in that chair for a long time, playing more minutes. The South Africans have switched between the two. And one other I would like to see in there, and it probably would have been a cue for the for the lower nations, is uh, Nathan Levu at, at, at 13. Look, and I, I know Gary and he's played well, mm. uh, but he's, he's been in a great team. Uh, through the whole season, and he, he hasn't been at 13 the whole time either. Whereas Nas the Levy's, what he's done with Fiji is mm. against really strong opposition has been, been outstanding. Well, you talk about players carrying teams on their shoulders, and um, Naya Thalevu definitely did that. Well, well done to the panel. I'm sure everybody can debate their selections over and over again, and everybody will come up with a different team. We're going to take another break here on the breakdown, come back on the other side and have a look at WXV and the World Cup Grand Final rematch.
just over the Ivana's line. Morgan for Dellinger. A couple of decoy runners. McKenzie. Lovely ball. Turned on the inside. Another off line. And the first try for Australia. Dellinger. Quick hands. A little bit of footwork from Fredericks. What a brilliant try, Australia. Kaipani. That's a try. Now the pick and go. Kaipani. Played with heart and with courage. 29 points to 20, Australia over France. Yes, love a hat trick of tries from a tight head prop, Eva Kapani for Australia. WXV1 going into its final weekend of competitions. The Aussies have done New Zealand a massive favour. We'll get into that in a sec. But firstly, Taylor, where did that come from the well, from, from the Wallaroo? <laughs> the typical French, right? Just <laughs> out of nowhere. I mean, the Wallaroos, they needed that. Australian rugby needed that. I mean, they got pants by the Black Ferns and England and Canada this year. And then to come out and do a performance like that against France, who beat the Black Ferns just last week, you know, let's not forget that. Um, they just banded together. And I think it's because of all that advers adversity they've been through, you know, those heavy losses. You know, they came out and spoke against Rugby Australia saying they haven't been treated fairly. I mean, for goodness sake, they're not even full-time professionals, yet all these other teams are. Um, their head coach is a school teacher, and he does this part-time. You know, for a professional rugby side, that's crazy, and particularly one at WXV. So I'm so happy for those Australian women. They so deserve that, um, and I think that's what this competition needed too because we'd seen some lopsided results, so that was great. Amazing um, what actually having a team together and in and, and camps and, and playing together can, can do for a side because the Aussies just don't get that. No, they don't, and it's probably shown uh, the, the golf in the women's rugby at the minute how some nations are a little bit further ahead than others. But I, I think this is exactly what this tournament's um, made to do, and more women's rugby it might not be as beneficial for, for the Black Ferns and things like that at times, but in the greater good of it, I think that's really good. And look, the game I saw last week, I, can't, I don't know how France actually lost that game considering how well they played against the All Blacks, so, or the Black Ferns, sorry. Just shows as well, and awesome for Australia, they needed, they needed something like that, but it just shows you how important in a physical game the headspace is. You know, and, and obviously France got a couple of things wrong during their preparation during the week. So good on the Wallaroos, awesome for them. Yeah. Australia needed a bit of a boost, so hopefully that provides something. Yeah, they made some France made some probably key changes that yeah. didn't help them as well. But what it does mean is effectively this last round of games, the very last match is England against New Zealand, the World Cup final rematch, and it's winner takes all. So whoever wins this match is going to win WXV1. But oh my gosh, World Cup final rematch, Taylor. England have been waiting for a year for this. <laughs> oh, have they? What? And I think the Blackburns have as well, because, you know, all the commentary from up north and even, you know, some people down south was, you only won that game because of that red card early to the winger and you had that, that advantage. And, you know, how come you didn't win by that much when you had a one-woman advantage the whole game? So Ask uh, South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, see, let's make change. Yeah. Let's make change. <laughs> well, I stand by what I said. There shouldn't have been a red card for the whole game in this one. It's not sour grapes, OK? But, you know, on that... Like, like, you know, they want to prove to everyone we deserve that. So they, they'll want to come up against England, but equally England, you know, they're devastated. They want to beat the Black Ferns, it's particularly at home where it hurts the most. Um, it's going to be a grandstand game, but both teams do look very different from the last time they played. No sevens players, a couple of retirements and things like that. So it is going to be an absolute spectacle. And we're going to be there, Ricky. Yes, How good? Yes. <laughs> well, I hope it's sold out again because this is what we need as well straight after last weekend. <laughs> Let's hope, uh, you know, they, <laughs> the hopes of nations are back in there again, aren't they? <laughs> We lose, bossy. Oh, <laughs> let's not think about that. I'll be having to console my nieces who are still remembering last year's final. Yeah, this is the thing. The kids now, they only know these teams winning. This is the thing. Like, you know, like, kids, it's not always that way. If we've got time to, to wrap up and, and obviously, yes, cannot wait uh, for Saturday. If you're going to head off to uh, Mount Smart Stadium, please do go along watch it. Highlight of the year. What were your takeaways from the rugby year from each of you? I'll, throw, I'll put you on the Let's spot. Let's start with Bussie. I had no idea I was throwing that at you, so... You could, could have given me a warning. No, uh, look, I... Took it all. Some team must have won down there, did they? Oh, we actually, we, we didn't even get to the final this year, oh. so the United, unfortunately, so let's not talk about that. No, but for me, I think uh, just rugby in general, being at that World Cup and I saw the, the quarterfinals... Um, Ireland uh, against the All Blacks and the next night, South Africa against uh, France. And to be honest, the greatest uh, spectacles occasions I've been, atmosphere, everything, France did it really, really well. For me, I really like sort of what we saw from the All Blacks, and I know they didn't get there, they didn't get the ultimate goal, but um, from where they come from and the adversity they've gone through, um, to get to where they, they nearly got to, they got 
everything but is would have been great satisfaction for that group and and I, I hope they're proud of themselves and and I uh, I really enjoyed watching that because the struggle they were under was real you know what I mean like it's a tough gig I can only imagine it's a tough gig that they went through and and they nearly pulled it off and that's what makes it a little bit harder for them I, I guess so it was it was it was nice to watch them finish on a high note the two quick ones the one Manusina beating Fiji to make it to WXV2 yes they lost but it was still good to get there and then Taranaki winning the NPC I picked it in week two <laughs> Hey. Everyone said I was crazy. Hello, we did it. So I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for Taranaki. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, as you said, the World Cup was a total vibe across the place. It was incredible to be part of um, with plenty to come. That is breakdown for you. That is not quite the rugby season because we have got one more very big game to come this Saturday, and that is the Black Ferns taking on England at Mount Smart Stadium. So enjoy your off-season after Saturday. Get along to Mount Smart if you're in the region. You guys have been awesome. Have a great off-season as well. And, uh, well, because we wanted to finish on a World Cup win, we're going to look back a year and we're going to see Black Ferns beating England in last year's World Cup final. We'll see you later. After six weeks and 25 matches, 12 teams have become two. New Zealand and England will vie for the Rugby World Cup trophy Aotearoa. Here's Harrison Scarrett. She's got killed on wide and killed done will strike in the opening two and a half minutes for England. Leela, oh, what a show.